What's up, guys? Welcome in to another exciting episode right here. I am joined by ABC10, Sean Cunningham. You guys know him. He has covered the Kings for 20 years. He's covered NBA Finals. He's covered any and everything that you can think of outside of the Kings as well. He knows all things pop culture, but we're not discussing that. Also on the show, we love him. He's a favorite of ours. He is the Locked On Kings podcast host. He, uh, you know him from his work at KHDK and every other thing that he does. The one, the only Matt George is here as well. And I got to say this, as of recently, Matt George will actually be joining the Tegna family, which is what ABC 10 is under. And Matt George will be coming on as a locked on uh, host and will be part of our family. So he's like, uh, I guess he's a relative now. So um, welcome to the family, Matt. We're happy to have you here. And um, we will uh, we, we look forward to working with you. I'm looking forward to working with you too, Kevin, as much as possible and bugging Sean on a daily basis now. I can't wait. Yeah, the coffee break, the coffee room is just down the hall and to the right, past the restrooms. Uh, Kevin likes coffee. I like tea. He likes it very sweet. I don't really, you know, just tea. Can I shine your shoes too, sir? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, we I expect the car washed once a week. And uh, no, it's great. It's great because Matt and I have very similar backgrounds coming from radio. And uh, now he's going to dip his toe in the water as of, television and all the and I just want to see him in makeup you know selfishly I just really want to see how this goes you know I, I don't know how the makeup will look on Matt you know I, I can I can hold off on that but I am curious to know how he looks shining your shoes that's going to be a really interesting uh image there to say the least You'll probably get a view of both, but truth be told, uh, when I did, this is going to make me look like even more of a loser than I actually am. But when I did uh, high school theater, we had to wear ma makeup for high school theater shows. And the first time I ever tried applying mascara to myself, I poked myself straight in the eyeball with it. So it'll be good. It'll, it'll be good. Wow. So we, we just are... learned a lot about Matthew here. We learned a lot about Mr. Matt George. Yeah. You know, I don't even want to talk about the Kings anymore. I just want to listen to Matt and more of his uh, no. interesting history with mascara. No, please, God, no. Let's talk about the draft or something, anything. <laughs> All right. Well, at any rate, Matt, of course, we are delighted to have you on board here. We definitely look forward to working with you and whatever all that entails. And just only one other thing. As Sean said, I, I, I drink, I actually don't drink coffee. Um, I, I don't take any kind of caffeine. Um, no, I just, just take snort straight cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, where did you think this energy came from? So, all right, kids. Uh, yeah, cocaine is a bad no, thing. No, cocaine is do bad. Don't do it. Yeah, it's a heck of a drug. drug. Rick James taught us that. All right, guys. Well, let's get on here and talk about what we're supposed to be talking about here, even though I love that introduction there. That went way longer than it should have. Obviously, guys, we are 24 hours away from the NBA draft. Here in Sacramento and in our region, all eyes point to that number ninth pick. So before we dive in, to who the Kings have had in town working out, who possibly um, can they be looking at with that ninth pick? I just want to throw this out there to you guys. What do you think that we should do? Do you think that we should trade the Who's ninth we? pick? Who's we? Well, you guys speak for the organization. So, you know, that, that's why I'm saying we, you know. you. So, so what, do you, what do you guys think? And I say we Kings fans, all right? All right. Um, what do you guys think that the Kings uh, should do with that? If you're playing Monty McNair right now, I'm going to ask you guys to put on your Monty McNair hats right now. What do you do with that ninth pick? Do you trade it away or do you hang on to it? Uh, I'm definitely trading it away. Uh, there's not a person I like at nine. Now, let's put it this way. Um, I've identified several people that I like. Uh, one that I really, really like that I think addresses not only best player available, but even a, a help now situation. We can Scotty get Barnes is not going to drop to number nine. Yeah, we Sean, sorry. <laughs> I was going to get to that in a moment, but even, yeah. Okay. They're the cats out of the back. Scotty Barnes, I think is, would be a tremendous fit in Sacramento. I, I really like even some of the pieces that would exist around him with the Kings. However, uh, I just don't see that as an option. Um, you'd have to trade up and I just don't see them necessarily doing that, but I do think I've been on record. I've been on record since last year. If Matt knows, you know, this team, the Kings suck and they need a lot of help. They have far too many holes and, uh, you know, everyone is on the table. I, I, and I really mean that there's no one tradables. I know you just, you know, everyone thinks the world of Tyrese Halliburton and De'Aaron Fox and, 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 a, a, and a tremendous season that, that Harrison Barnes just came off of, but you're terrible. So nobody is off the table. And, and we've talked to Matt and I have talked about it a lot in the event of, you know, look at the moves that have, it, that it's taken for teams to land star talent, the Paul Georges of the world, the Kawhi Leonard's of the world, 
uh, it, you have to sacrifice a lot to do that. And I think the Kings are uh, in a situation where they can do that, having all of their draft picks and having some young budding superstars, possibly stars um, on their, on the roster and people that could definitely help good teams. So yeah, I'm exploring trades. If I'm Monty McNair, I've called every single team I've offered everybody. Uh, I've let them know that anybody could be had for things that I like. Uh, now, obviously you have to be smart. You're not going to just give away the farm, but there are risks that, that they're certainly involved here. And uh, yeah, I think there is some talent at nine, but I think there's talent all throughout this draft. And uh, for me, if I'm the Kings, I'm not trying to really develop any young talent that doesn't have star potential. And if I feel that there's no star potential in this draft, which there is, or around the pick that I'm getting, I'm trying to move it. And uh, I think they really, really need to be aggressive right now. Okay, so Sean is on the record right now saying that he would trade uh, that pick if it were him. Matt, I'm coming to you, buddy. What are you doing? Are you keeping it or are you trading it? Yeah, my goal for the the Sacramento Kings for this draft has always been making the moves necessary to back up what you said. And I say you, meaning Monty McNair and head coach Luke Walton in their their postseason press conferences. They both talked about, hey, the goal for next season is making the playoffs. They set the bar for us, and I, I appreciated that. But I think we all agreed that in order for them to actually reach that bar, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, and acquiring talent in the draft and asking them to be immediate impact players to help make the playoffs, that's a big ask. Now, I think there are some pieces potentially around nine that could come and fit in Sacramento that can help this team a little bit. But again, trading the pick is your best move that you could make to try and acquire the talent that is needed to actually accomplish that goal. Now, I don't think the Kings are miles upon miles upon miles away from making it to the playoffs, especially with the play-in coming back and that being an option. You really, ha- you only have to be in the upper, what, 40% now, basically, or just stay out of that lower 40% in order to make it into the draft um, or rather make it into the playoffs. Uh, so if I'm the Kings, I'm looking to shop this pick. I'm looking to attach this pick to either a Buddy Heald or Marvin Bagley to help get something of value as well as open up some cap space uh, if I can. Uh, that being said, I'm not just making a deal to make a deal. If if the right deal is out there, you make it. But if the right deal or if you can't find that deal, instead of just selling the nine pick for nothing or or attaching it to Bagley just to get some bad player in return to open up cap space, I'm looking at number nine. I'm looking at guys like Moses Moody or Franz Wagner, pieces that I do believe could help the Sacramento Kings a little bit as a rookie. But no one you're going to get at nine, I agree with Sean, no one really you're going to get at nine has that star potential, unless someone's completely going under the radar, has that star potential to come in and be that big of a difference maker. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you. You know, it's funny. You said unless there's somebody that goes under the radar. Yes, we've seen in drafts in the past where there are those players that kind of go under the radar, may drop to 15th, 16th, or in the case of this past year, the MVP of the the league was a second round draft pick in uh, Jokic. So every now and then, you know, even Giannis, he went, what, 15th, I think, or 16th, whatever it was. So every now and then you guys have that under the radar player. But I do agree with the both of you guys. There's no one in this particular draft that I'm looking at, especially around the ninth or 10, you know, that would drop to nine or 10, that would be able to make an immediate impact and transform this team. As you said, they are on the record. When I say they, the Kings are on the record of saying we want to win now. It has been 15 years since the last time that they won the playoffs. I mean, that's crazy. 15 years ago, we were all adolescents, I think, or something like that. I don't know. My math is off. Maybe we were in our early 20s. It just seems like it's been a long time. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's one of those things. It's like, how much longer are we going to be a work in progress? How much longer are you going to draft guys and say, we're going to develop them. We're going to improve them. And then we're going to be, you know, get them to the level where we make the playoffs every year. I, I, I like the mentality of win now. I like the immediacy of it. And um, I just don't know if there's a guy in this particular draft that would fall to nine. That is a instantaneous um, impact uh, a transformative player that will, uh, you know, make this team better. So, so well, and I would say, I would say to that though, that there is, first of all, it depends on how the draft shakes out. I mean, just look at last year's draft. None of us were thinking that Tyrese Halliburton would fall to 12 and he came in and he absolutely changed what the Kings do. They added a playmaking presence. Um, the basketball IQ got immensely better because this team was lacking so much of that. 
Um, so I do think, you know, depending on how things shake out, yeah, there could be things that, that are added and, the, and, and a player could be an impact player. I just don't know that it's an impact player that gets you uh, those wins you're searching for that, that's transformative, your, 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 your roster or even your franchise. So, yeah, I get what you're saying there too, but I don't want people to think, oh, you know, screw this draft, let's pack it up and go home because, you know, there, there could be some things that are intriguing here, even, even below nine. Um, where you yeah. got guys that can maybe come in and address certain needs for sure. One of the questions that I've been asking different draft analysts and experts on the Locked on Kings podcast over the last month is what they think the value of the nine pick is in trade conversations compared to years past or compared to, I guess, normal years or other draft years. And it's almost been a 50-50 split, 50% saying it has less value because this draft is so top heavy and 50% saying, no, there's some secret value at that nine range that I think teams are going to recognize and show an urgency to move up. I mean, we just saw the Memphis Grizzlies move up to 10 and they might even be interested in moving ahead of the Sacramento Kings to potentially grab a piece like Wagner who has been uh, attached to Sacramento so there might be interest in that range to me if I'm Monty McNair I don't know why I'd be afraid of a swing for the fences move in fact I'm almost asking for it and part of that is just the, the little chaotic demon on my shoulder just saying hey do something different let's get something to talk about but at the same time I mean this it's not been Monty McNair's fault this is only his his second off season. Uh, but this team has tried and failed so many times through the draft. I mean, I think De'Aaron Fox is the De'Aaron Fox and Demarcus Cousins are the only two to actually get second contracts in the last decade or something like that. I could be wrong there, but I believe it's, it's along those lines. The draft has been a struggle for the Sacramento Kings, despite the amount of times that they've been in the lottery. So why not? look at to your future assets and and like Sean said not being afraid to trade them package future assets together along with a piece that you have like a Bagley or a buddy that maybe has low value now but has potential to be good somewhere else and try and milk that value to make a swing for the fences move and go out and get a fringe star or a solid veteran talent or two that can really be day one difference makers for the Sacramento Kings. That's what I would be scanning the horizon for if I'm Monty McNair, calling every single team and seeing what's available, what's realistic, and what's not. That's good. We're going to get into some of the potential trade scenarios in a second here, but I like the mentality of swing for the fence. I mean, what do you have to lose? You guys have been trash the last 10 plus years. You know, at, at this point, it's like you can only go up from the bottom. So why not swing for the fence? And, uh, I don't know. As they say, shoot your shot, literally and figuratively speaking. So let's talk about, OK, we already talked about what we would do as far as um, trading away that pick. The Kings say they do not trade away that pick. They keep the pick. Let's talk about some of the guys um, that could potentially uh, end up here. You know, this is not just going off draft boards, but also some of the guys that the Kings have worked out. I'm curious who you guys like. Um, who you don't like. Uh, so, you know, um, we'll start off Kai Jones from UT, uh, Texas big man. He uh, had a workout here. Keon Johnson um, had a workout here. And then obviously the, uh, the two guys you just mentioned, Matt, Franz Wagner and Moses Moody um, are two guys that can potentially fall either in the eighth, ninth, 10th, somewhere around that area. So, you know, my, my thing, you know, as far as improvements, the Kings need a lot of improvements, you know, defense, uh, especially is one of their biggest things that they need improvement in. But, you know, when you look at a lot of the guys that they brought in and even some of the guys that are rumored to go here with the ninth pick, you you're seeing everyone you're seeing forwards, um, uh, uh, guards, big men. Uh, I guess my question, I'm gonna just throw it out there to you guys. Who do you like with that ninth pick? If you had to stick with the ninth pick, you're not trading away. Who do you like? And out of those players, who do you think would have an immediate impact um, for the better uh, coming to Sacramento? Well, for me, I think, you know, I've already talked about Scotty Barnes and he won't be there at nine. But I think another guy I feel the same about who won't be there at nine either would be James Booknight from UConn. Uh, I feel like he'll be gone, but I think he's somebody that's probably gone definitely by eight where the Orlando Magic pick and possibly as high as where the Golden State Warriors pick. Uh, I think he would come in and obviously add just absolute tremendous shooting. He's a guy that's really saw his stock rise a lot. Uh, somebody I think he could help a lot, but, you know, obviously the, the, the popular name is Franz Wagner for a guy, but the one thing that concerns me is as, as tremendous as he is defensively, especially in, you know, team defense, uh, you know, decent shooter, not a great shooter, but he's not really elite at any one thing. And, and he's just a very solid, steady player. 
um, you know, has some pretty decent size to him, uh, like a six eleven, I believe at this point in his career where he's at now. And, um, Mo, but I mean, and he's not Mo Wagner. Everyone thinks Mo Wagner and, and oh, it's his, it's his offspring. It's his brother, you know, just the guy who got posterized by Marcus, by Marvin Bagley in the uh, California classic, but no, it's not him. And, uh, this kid is much more, much more of a winning player. And I think people obviously are looking at him and there's, you see all these mock drafts is just making the most sense. And I think if you get Mo Wagner, or excuse me, I'm talking about Mo Wagner. I think if you get Franz Wagner, you're, 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 you're going to feel pretty good if you're a Kings fan, but I think that's if you're looking at that, you're almost looking at that player that can help right away, as opposed to somebody who might have a little bit more star potential, maybe like a Keon Johnson, who just has incredible athleticism, uh, can do a lot, obviously will need to develop. And also Alperin Shingun from the Turkey Turkish league, I mean, this kid's 18. This guy, it looks like the second coming of Nikola, jo- Nikola Jokic or DeMontis Savonis. Uh, incredible footwork and has been playing professional basketball since he was 12 years old. So even even that's a lot of mileage. He was the Turkish MVP. Um, there's, I mean, just the skills that he has alone would be incredible to develop on, at the NBA level. And, and those are some of those type of risks you talk about. But if I'm doing it, to me, I, I think Book Knight is my guy circled with a bullet and uh, – possible he's there i don't think he'll be there outside of that i don't know man go ahead matt <laughs> i really don't know hey i'm not mad at the turkish guy another turkish guy they drafted by the name of hito turkulu worked out pretty well so we'll see but matt take it away yeah kevin it's interesting the first two names that you brought up were keon johnson and kai jones and those are the two prospects along with jalen johnson that scare the crap out of me and it's, it's because of their boom or bust potential, but also the developmental timeline. And I think this is more of a fear from a Kings perspective than it is a fear with them as a player. But the Kings have struggled so much to maximize those boom or bust developmental talents in the past that I don't know how much I trust them. Plus, you look at the timeline of wanting to win right now. You have De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton are, are looking to be on a win now timeline or part of the core immediately, even though they're younger guys. Can Kai Jones and or how long would it take Jones or both of the Johnsons to catch up to that? That is a concern for me, which is why I would avoid them. Uh, Franz Wagner is my favorite pick at nine, but I readily admit he is more of a safer pick, a a higher floor, but a lower ceiling than potentially those guys that I mentioned. Uh, But Wagner immediately provides deep help on the defensive end, which I like. He fills a position of need or at least provides depth at a position of need. I agree with Sean 100% though, that he is not an elite at any one area. He's a good all around player and the Kings aren't necessarily in a position to draft for safety. I mean, they, it's, it's understandable if the Kings want to try for a swing for the fences move, like we talked about in a trade scenario. However, Franz Wagner being um, his biggest strength, being his size and his defense, uh, the fact that he is considered like an analytical darling and the analytical pick of this draft. And we know Monty McNair's analytics background coming from uh, Daryl Morey and the Houston Rockets. I think it just makes a lot of sense. It checks a lot of boxes and he could be the best player potentially available at that range in addition to being biggest fit. But you guys know the Kings have drafted for fit in the past instead of best player available. And that's gotten them into trouble. So I just have a natural distrust of the draft. But if the Kings make a selection at nine, uh, my pick is Franz Wagner. And I'll say this too, because I was looking at, you know, one of the guys that's intrigued me the most, and I think it's a guy who we've all seen play a lot is Davion Mitchell. Uh, but his size is just unbelievably small for the NBA. He could be a phenomenal player. I think he is a, a winning player, uh, but man, if he was two inches taller, and I know you can say that just really about any player in the NBA uh, that has gone through the draft process. And that's just a common take where it's like, man, if this kid was just two inches taller, if, if, <laughs> I would tell you this, as Davion Mitchell was two inches taller, he'd probably be a top three pick. And let me add one more name in there, too, because we've heard reports recently of interest in Josh Giddy from the Sacramento Kings perspective. Josh Giddy would be the third primary ball handler, potentially, that the Kings would have, which I don't know how that fits, but Giddy is big, uh, seemed to believe that he would be a, a small forward or a three at the NBA level, so... I'm interested in Giddy. I like the idea potentially. I, I still think Wagner would be the better pick there. Even Moses Moody would be the better pick there over Giddy. But that just goes to show that really after pick five or six, this draft is completely wide open. And the chaos of that alone is making draft night must watch television for me. Interest, interested, but not Giddy for Giddy. 
You said interested, but not what? Would that be fair? Interested, but not giddy for giddy. Interested, but not giddy. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sean, thank you for the pun there. We, You're welcome. We, we appreciate that. Giddy for good, giddy, goody, any, see, yeah, I can't even see say there. it now. That's why it, you leave it, it to me. Leave the driving to me, pal. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, you know, with that said, it sounds like the consensus is either Wagner or, uh, or, or Moody at that pick, but. We got to help Kevin here. Wagner. Wagner. Looks like Wagner, Wagner. Vag- Wagner. Okay. Franz I keep mispronouncing Wagner. it. Wagner. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Another, another uh, a German guy, uh, Dirk Nowitzki. I used to always say Nowitzki, but you pronounce the W as a V. There you go. Um, look at that. And I didn't even take Rosetta Stone. So uh, <laughs> with, with, that, with that being said, guys, you know, now let's talk a little bit about some of the potential um, trades that can happen. Uh, obviously, someone who is kind of been in the news a lot over the last 48 hours involving a potential trade with the Kings is good old Buddy Hill. Um, you know, there's everything of uh, talks of him potentially going a trade package for the 76ers. Um, I've even heard at some point, you know, interest in Ben Simmons. I don't know if that can actually go through because, of course, they would want an all star caliber player. And, um, you know, like Sean said, whenever you go after trying to acquire an all star, you have to pretty much give up everything, including your right kidney. So, you know, what is it that they're able to get up, give up in order to acquire somebody of a star caliber. And then also, um, you know, in addition to, to Buddy Hill, you, you look at the potential of losing Rashawn Holmes. He's going to demand a lot of money. Um, and then Marvin Bagley, the third, you know, he's obviously not happy. So you have, you know, aside from the draft and all that other stuff, you, you're looking at the core and some of the other things that are going on. Um, even Luke Walton. I mean, it sounds like they're sold on him at least for another year or so, but um, you know, you look over the next few years and what the makeup of this team is going to be. So I guess my question, where does Buddy Hill end up? Does he play? Um, is he wearing a King's uniform this, ne- this next season? Um, or do you, do you, do you move him? No, I, I was asked, you know, I had a very much a uncomfortable interview recently on the radio where I was asked, we're talking about the draft and, and they're asking me to make yes or no prediction. It was Doug Christie, by the way, who's saying yes or no, Sean, is this person on the team? Blah, blah, blah. And he's like without, and I said, well, that's impossible to answer because we don't even have the draft yet. And obviously the draft is that first moment of, of, of the off season where anything can happen. And so really depending upon what happens in the draft really kind of opens up the horizons of what happens beyond in, in the future of this off season. And even then it can get complicated. What if this team doesn't do anything? They draft, like you said, Matt, maybe Franz Wagner, that safe pick. And then you're going into your off season that way. Has that really changed your landscape of your team? Well, no, it hasn't. So what we'll know on draft day is whether and what the, what the makeup of this team looks like. So it is a tough question to answer, but I had to answer it. And Buddy Heald was one of them. And I said, no, my gut feeling tells me that Buddy Heald will not be on this team next year. And part of that is because I feel this team is going to want to move one of their big contracts. Obviously Fox, I just don't see Fox being moved um, for the likes of Ben Simmons. I just don't think they're going to do it. Uh, In fact, in conversations I've had, it just doesn't seem like it's much of a starting point there. That's not to say things don't change day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. So, um, but no, the one that, that makes sense to me is Buddy Heald or Harrison Barnes. And I feel like Buddy, is going to be the easier one to move because he has elite shooting ability. What the Kings ask of Buddy Heald on this team is not fair. It's not great for his makeup. What the, what the, a team like the Lakers would, or the Sixers or the magic or not the magic suit or the, or the, uh, or the Mavericks would ask of Buddy Heald to be is exactly what you want Buddy Heald to be. And he'll fit in better. He's a type of player that will go to another team and almost flourish in a system uh, that's different from what you've seen here in Sacramento. And, and I always say, I remind people the way Buddy Heald played under Dave Yeager and, and really uh, oh, you yeah. saw the, the player that earned that contract. So um, because of that, yeah, I do think we will see Buddy Heald move. Do I think it's that Lakers move with, with Kyle Kuzma. Kuzma? And, you know, if they're asking for Montrez Harrell, uh, yeah, I mean, it intrigues me. But the Kings have never made a, a deal with the Lakers, ever, ever. They just never, not in the Sacramento era. They've never made a, a deal with the Los Angeles Lakers. So not to say they can't, but I do feel Buddy Heald is the – prime piece to be added to a three-way four-way team move that's massive that could involve 
of Ben Simmons. And that doesn't mean that Ben Simmons is coming to Sacramento. doesn't mean Damian Lillard is coming to Sacramento, but could be one of those pieces that is added to one of these uh, big type deals along with a first round future first round pick to land you something. And I don't know what that something is, Matt, but uh, I think, I think he's the one that he's the candidate to me that would, would not surprise me that he'd I'd be the least surprised to see Buddy Heald move. Sean, I think what you're speaking to there with Buddy is the natural fear and uh, bad expectation of Kings fans where wherever Buddy goes, he's going to excel. He's going to be successful. It's the same uh, prediction and fear that I've heard with Marvin Bagley. Well, Marvin's going to be traded to this team. He's going to all of a sudden become healthy and be that 20 and 10 guy that everybody thought he was going to be when he was drafted number two overall. So the Kings fan fear is very real, especially if you're trading Buddy Hill to the Los Angeles Lakers. You know the the difference though? You know the difference there though is like if I've I've heard it because I see it on my timeline all the time but the difference is is Marvin Bagley isn't 28 29 years old right. nor does he make the 80 million dollars and have 63 million dollars left on his deal like Buddy Hield does so they shouldn't feel that way about Marvin Bagley I get it with 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 uh, I mean no they should feel more about it with Marvin Bagley than Buddy Hield because Buddy Hield is already a huge cog in that pie of of salary ch- uh, cap and it and it you have those are the types of pieces you have to move to get better Oh, I agree completely. And Buddy Heald in LA, I think could thrive. Buddy Heald in Philadelphia, I think could thrive because for the reasons you listed, it's his his position would be established, his role would be established, uh, and uh, I, I think he could really help both those teams. But in terms of like a package, we've talked a lot about and heard a lot about uh, this Kyle Kuzma, Montrez Harrell, and pick yeah. twenty two uh, for Buddy Heald. Or I mean, the Lakers would have to attach either Montrez Harrell or uh, KCP, Contavious Caldwell Pope, to the deal in order to make it work. Those are literally the only two players under contract that they'd probably be willing to move to make this deal work or would be able to make this deal work. And out of the two, I prefer Montrez Harrell simply because if KCP were attached to the deal, you're taking on more money to move Buddy Heald and his $22 million contract. Even if it saves you money long-term in the short term, that hurts you and potentially your Rashawn Holmes sweepstakes. So I wonder if Montrez Harrell and Kyle Kuzma in 22 is the absolute peak value that you can get for Buddy Heald. I'm sure there are tons of conversations going on that haven't been rumored or, or, or have gotten out yet, but I wouldn't be surprised at all, like Sean said, uh, if Buddy Heald is gone. In fact, I think it needs to happen if the Kings want to make the moves. Now, it's almost like, and I, I this sounds like a negative Buddy Heald thing, but it's really not, but Buddy is like that, that, piece of the dam that is just stopping the flow right now and you remove him and then things can flow a little bit I'm not talking about on the offensive end I'm just talking about once the Kings are able to move Buddy and his money what regardless of what money or what assets they take back in return it frees them up a little bit to try and make other moves to try and make a Rashawn Holmes move to make a decision on Marvin Bagley uh, so I think Buddy Heald being gone is not only a priority it seems like based off of what we've been reading as of late, it's suddenly become a likelihood, which I think is uh, interesting because a few months ago we were talking about Buddy's low value and his $22 million contract, meaning he was going to be difficult to move period. Yeah. Well, I I love the, the damn reference there. You know, you, you move him out and all the blessings flow uh, upon thee. So uh, you know, obviously buddy is one of the, has established himself as one of the premier shooters in the league. um, And we obviously know what he can do now. My, my, the thing I wanted to ask is this. So you look at some of the highly prized, you know, free agents out there, or just people that can be moved. You know, we talked about Ben Simmons, Sean, you brought up Damian Lillard. Um, I, Kawhi is, is up this year. You know, when you look at all of the superstar caliber guys that are out there, realistically, who would the Kings be able to acquire um, when you look at some of the talent that's out there? And is it something, is it just another pipe dream about, oh, yeah, we can get, uh, you know, uh, Kawhi or we can get Damian or, or, or whoever, or, you know, realistically, who, who could they be able to get? Go ahead, Matt, because I because I, well, I'll say this. I just don't think that any of those are possibilities. I think Ben Simmons, there's some intrigue there, but I think it's it's not about luring Damian Lillard or Dam, Dam, or, or Ben Simmons. I, I think you want to be active in your conversations so you can be a third wheel in, in 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 that in that trade, that that third, fourth team maybe to help facilitate a trade so that you can get a solid added a solid piece to your puzzle. Could that be like 
what you saw with with Rodney Hood and or excuse me, not Rodney Hood, with Gary Trent Jr. just recently, who was packaged around someone who's still somewhat young. Karis Levert just had that same type of deal in the James Harden deal. He was moved twice. He went from Houston and on his way to Indiana. That's the type of pieces that, that the Kings should be focused on. Uh, a player who may be in his first big contract or maybe just about to get his first big contract that they can actually afford to sign a player like that but anywhere would a player from like, that range. But my question to that is, would a player like that establish this win now or, or contribute to this win now philosophy, this playoff now oh, yeah, absolutely. philosophy? Absolutely. Yeah, because, I mean, you don't want someone who's too long in the tooth. Someone like Russell Westbrook, I don't think would be the right fit in Sacramento. A little bit too long in the tooth, too much miles on there. But someone like Tobias Harris, if you're looking at a – Philadelphia situation Tobias Harris is kind of right in that range to where if you could land him uh, you know if they were to move him and not Ben Simmons just for example I think they would move Ben Simmons but to me Tobias Harris after the year he had is almost more attractive to a lot of teams right now especially you know look if they were to add Buddy Heald for example okay maybe it's not a Ben Simmons move maybe adding another shooter uh, helps Philly beyond what you know losing Ben Simmons would mean so maybe you try to fit around Ben Simmons more in that regard rather than kick him out the door now I think everyone in Philly is like no we want him out the door but uh, using that as an example yeah you know you said not a seasoned veteran with a lot of miles on their 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 legs like a Russell Westbrook but then again you look at Chris Paul and what he just did absolutely the Suns who was a team that as we all know the Suns were horrific the last 10 years. And you get someone 36 or 35, when, however he owed uh, Chris Paul was, and they acquired him, and c- completely transforms that team around. So um, I totally understand what you're saying, but I would not overlook a veteran if they – maybe not Russell Westbrook, but, you know, someone that can bring in um, that kind of instantaneous leadership and uh, those intangibles that they need. Uh, Matt, I saw you are about to say something. Yeah, no, I think the key there, though, Kevin, with the the Chris Paul conversation is the fact that Chris came to Phoenix and joined the core there. The core wasn't sacrificed to acquire Chris like I believe it would have to be to acquire these names that are potentially available for the Sacramento Kings. I will say I appreciate Monty McNair backing up what he said when he was first hired that he wants to put the Kings in a position to be active in these trade talks. And I I appreciate the fact that McNair is not just maybe doing what uh, ownership or uh, front offices have done in Sacramento in the past and just say, well, we're, we're, we're Sacramento, we're the Kings. We don't really have much of a shot at this. So we're not even going to involve ourselves. I appreciate seeing the Kings involved and as interest in Damian Lillard. They should, I appreciate them having interest in Ben Simmons. They should, those are the type of players that this team needs to end this playoff drought. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. And I would say it's pretty much a pipe dream as long as they're committed to maintaining their De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton core here in Sacramento. Now, do I believe both Fox and Halliburton are untradeable? No, but I think the Kings would have to be blown away by a deal to say bye-bye to more Fox than Halliburton. But I I think both are are pretty comfortable uh, in their longevity here in Sacramento, at least for the the time being. So I think the Kings absolutely should be involved in all of these conversations one way or another. The worst any team can do is say no. And then you're, you're brought up as that third team conversation, potentially for salary filler, like Sean was alluding to. Uh, But I I don't mind the Kings in the conversation at all. I I like them being involved for all these names. And those are the swing for the fences moves that I think needs to happen. If this team wants to have a chance of avoiding the NBA record 16 straight playoff list seasons. And the thing with the Suns, too, with like with Chris Paul, you know, he that's exactly the type of move the Kings need, which is that player that obviously brings an identity with yeah. it that just changes because this King, this Kings team has no identity. But I will say, too, and I can't say this enough. And we talked about it during the NBA finals, Kevin, which is, you know, Chris Paul joined a team that was on the upswing and we saw what that looked like in the bubble. And they went undefeated. You know, they, everyone's like, what are they doing here? They had nothing to lose. And so they had that momentum going into the offseason, and then they had Chris Paul. You know what I mean? So it's not like Chris Paul was there and all of a sudden turned things around. It's a small sample size for sure, and Chris Paul helped do incredible things, in which case, you know, hopefully he's back in Phoenix because how do you, how do you lose a guy like that? I don't care if he is 35, 36 years old. Like, how do you lose a guy like that after doing what you just did? So – um it, I think it's interesting I think there's a lot of possibilities out there I think there's possibilities we haven't talked about I think one of them is Demonis Sabonis you know I think Miles Turner it's guys like that um that, that are just you know I even think Carl Anthony Towns for what Minnesota looks like uh I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of 
teams trying to pull him out of the situation that he's in with Minnesota. Uh, certainly, it looks, you know, Minnesota's in that odd range where it's like you've got this superstar and just some young up and coming talent below him, um, you know, minus Ricky Rubio, who'd be a free agent. But it's like, you know, what does that look like? And, and maybe it's a Josh Okogi. Maybe you're looking at you identify a guy or two down the line here. You know, Andrew Wiggins is going to be moved. You know, Andrew Wiggins is a king's killer, uh, for lack of a better term. So he could be somebody. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of intriguing possibilities. You just don't want to make the wrong move. And I think so often we hear, and, and, I, and I, I kind of fault Monty McNair with this in a way because he wants to have that optionality for that big home run swing for the fences move. But if, but I would caution people because when you say that, people get, oh man, we're going to get someone like Paul George or Kawhi Leonard or Ben Simmons or you know Dame Lillard. But if that swing for the fences move is a Karis LeVert, which I think would be an absolute grand slam, I don't think a lot of fans know much about Karis LeVert to really believe that it would be a grand slam. They'd think it'd be more like a, maybe a ground rule double <laughs> or, or even somebody like, you know, Laurie Markkinen, who I agree would not be a grand slam nor a home run, but it's more like a double to me, maybe a triple, maybe it's a system fit, blah, blah, blah. That's not a Chris Weber esque type franchise changing move. And it's possible that those, those moves are out there. That's not one of them. But maybe it's a CJ McCollum, you know, and maybe you have to disrupt this backboard of the future that you have. And again, you, you mentioned Tyrese Halliburton. And again, I know people want to smack me in the face, but it's like, yes, Tyrese could be this very, very good player. But will his value ever be bigger than it is right now? Think about that. He slipped. He was a rookie of the year finalist. Everyone knows what he can do now. Everyone, they just think he's going to get better. And there's no big the biggest thing is there's no big money attached to him. Plus, you've got three more years of him under a rookie scale. You know, that that's incredible if you could if, if you that should be a huge bargaining chip if you're in the likes of these conversations of the like of some of these players you've talked about well you know like like we said this is Monty Vignier this is only his second off season so obviously he, he he's still getting um getting in there and having these conversations but I think the key is like you said is to make sure that you're having these conversations and you're in the loop because you know you give him three years who knows this franchise can't could turn around you talked about Weber when they acquired him. What was that in 2001, whenever it was? And remember, I think it was Weber's father who kind of had to talk him in to uh, coming to Sacramento, which turned out to be the best thing that ever happened for him because, as we know, he had his greatest years. 1999, and, uh, Kevin. And, and, 99. And, and, and can people still – I mean, it's unbelievable that they got Chris Weber for Mitch Richmond. I mean, it is just – Mitch Richmond was on the down end of his career, still a solid player – uh, I'm, I'll never talk about the rock in any disparaging way, but to get Chris Weber, who was a bona fide all-star granted, he had a couple little off the court instances that, that, that were, that kind of tainted his name a bit, but to get him, uh, for Mitch Richmond, who's on the downside of his career was just an absolute robbery. It was, and it, it turned out to be one of the greatest, uh, you know, one of the greatest moves acquisitions the Kings have had over the last, I, I don't know, the last 30 years, who knows? Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of Kings fans are longing for those Weber years. I mean, those Western conference finals years, and it, those seem like an eternity away, but, um, you got to respect the fact that this mentality of win now make the playoffs now is at least in the right direction after going 15 years without a, uh, playoff, uh, appearance, you know, that drought is bound to end and it's bound to end extremely, uh, uh, very soon. So I guess just sum it up, you know, final thoughts on this, you know, um, tomorrow, at this time, well, actually not at this time tomorrow, a few hours later tomorrow at this time, we'll know exactly what the Kings end up doing. Um, I know both of you guys have uh, have been supportive and advocated uh, to trade away that ninth pick. But, um, you know, uh, if they do hold on to it, is this something that still leaves you guys optimistic and happy about the potential to end this playoff drought? We're both advocating for trades, but neither one of us have the balls to say who they're trading for. And that's the, that's the rub right there. Cause you don't, you just really don't know. And uh, yeah, I mean, you just have to be aggressive and you want to see them kind of make a move and, and swing for offenses to bring in a type of player who can help fit the trajectory that this team is on. Uh, I think dramatic makeover is needed. And uh, uh, it's look, you got, you got draft free agency and trades and draft and free trades are the ones that are the most suitable for getting better for a small market team like this, like Sacramento. So, uh, you know, free agency, you're not luring that big, that big time player, no matter how much money you're, you're out, you're dangling in front of them. So um, you have to be able to use the draft and trades. And this is the first step. And I think, I think the Kings will look different. I don't know if it's dramatically different, but I do feel like there's going to be a move made. Uh, if I was a betting man, I feel like they're moving the pick. 
go ahead, Matt. I have, you know, that that's where I'm, I'm at. I think we're kind of in a, in a similar thought pattern there. Yeah. And for me, it's what I need from the Sacramento Kings is a full commitment to the plan. And this is from top to bottom, ownership, front office, coaching staff, players, full commitment to we are trying to make the playoffs and that is it. I found myself very frustrated with the what felt like changes in the midst of last season where we heard all this talk about gap year and hey, maybe uh, this will be the great year for the Kings to just see what they have, throw a young team out there. Maybe they're putting a good draft position for this top heavy draft and then all of a sudden while the Kings are winning games, we're at the trade deadline, we have assets that we can potentially trade no instead we're going to go the route of and i'm using the we from the king's perspective uh we're going the route of we're going to actually be buyers at the trade deadline and we're going to roll the dice and we're going to go for it and then we're going to come up short again i need to see the commitment to the plan of okay it's really playoffs or bust make the moves swing for the fences try to actually make the playoffs and if you fail if it comes up short I mean, you're going to be judged by that, but can we really hold it against a team who hasn't been in the playoffs for 15 straight years? If Monty tries something and it doesn't work, I appreciate that more than towing the line between these two. Uh, oh, we want to commit to this, but oh, we're winning now, but we want to go back to the, I, I just, I need a full commitment basically. And whatever the Kings do on draft night, I hope it is towards that full commitment of being a team that is going to win next season, which is why I'm hoping for a trade and I'm avoiding or wanting to see the Kings avoid a, um, Keon Johnson or Kai Jones pick. And that's the tough part, you know, because I, I, I hear that and I echo that because, you know, playoff basketball is sorely needed in Sacramento. I think it would be good for a lot of these younger players around this team to experience that. Um, but I'll, rem- I'll remind people that GMs don't play for seasons. They play for, for franchises and they play for dynasties and, and beyond the one year. So it, it is a tough situation to be in. No one's thinking that the Kings are building a championship per se, because you got to start somewhere, but the goal is championship all the time. And it's, you know, that's not happening anytime soon. So I get it. You got to start somewhere. And again, I think the play in tournaments definitely help, but it's not quite the playoffs. And again, you know, I saw someone the other day say, Oh, this would be the year that the Kings get seventh. You know, they finish seventh, they make the playoffs, but because of the play in tournament, they play the play in tournament and they get bounced. And in which case the streak continues because making the playoff tournament is not making the playoffs. It is not making the playoffs. You can treat it as such, just like you can treat the last, you know, the last month of a season where all those games have playoff implications. You can just as easily treat those as playoff games. And the Kings have been in that situation for the past two years, but that's not playoffs. So, (laughs) Sean, do the Kings, if that happens, if they make the play in tournament and get bounced, do they end that streak on a technicality because it's postseason? No, I disagree. I agree. I mean, I agree with you too. I don't think it counts at all, no. but I've, I've seen people say, well, it's technically. And, and here's, and Kevin, and, and here's why guys, like you can't, you don't want to make it in a gimmick. You want to solidify yourself as a playoff team. Gimmick doesn't work. Now, look, people used to say about the wild card in baseball and in football. Oh, it's this gimmick. Did you make the playoffs? Did you make the playoffs? Well, now that you're 10 years into it. Okay. It's part of the, it's part of what it is. So maybe that's the little caveat. I'll give it that wild card is postseason. But for the play-in tournament, it's still too gimmicky for me. I can't do it. It sure didn't feel like the Raiders made the playoffs when they were bounced in the wild card by the Texans a number of years ago. So I understand that completely. You know, I'm going to say this. I I totally agree with you guys. But in my book, which clearly Kevin's book really doesn't matter, but in my book, play-in tournament is postseason. And if it qualifies as postseason, technically that is a playoff. So, yes, I do believe that the streak ends if they qualify, if they make the play-in tournament, because play-in tournament is postseason, which essentially is the playoffs. However, now, can I say something? However, <laughs> Kevin, go ahead. you go off and score 45 points. It's a career high, right? Not only is it a career high, but it happens in the play-in tournament. Well, guess what? It's not your playoff career high. It is the, it is the play-in game career high. That's how the NBA structures it. So it's not deemed postseason. So that's the only correction I have to make there. I had to ask this because the Warriors, for example, and I checked with their PR people, uh, they were just in the play-in tournament. They got to experience the play-in tournament. Steph Curry goes off and let's say he hits, you know, 10 threes in a game. Is that the, you know, whatever playoff career high? He says, nope, that would be the playoff. That would be the play-in tournament career high. So those are a whole separate set of, of rules. 
So for what I, it's I, worth. I, I do agree. I, I guess I guess there'll be an asterisk there if they end up making the play in tournament. But essentially, I don't think it does matter. Uh, essentially, it does. I don't think it matters because think about it. The play in tournament is the, to determine who gets those eight seeds for the playoffs. So, yes, you know, I, I understand it can go either way, but I, I, I will say this as we try to sum things up here. I, I, I do honestly like the fact that the Bucks won this past year because, and I'm going to tie that to the Kings because it shows that, yes, in a small market city, you can win, um, you know, you can win championships. And another thing I want to say in regards to that is that, yes, it's always been a struggle to acquire top talent here, not just because obviously it has a history of losing, but also because we, as we know, Sacramento is not a destination city. It's not a New York. It's not an LA. It's not a, you know, some of these other uh, areas, but when you have a small market team that does have success and shows you that it can be done and, and look, look at all the fans that were in Milwaukee, their district, like hundreds of thousands. Like, I mean, I think that's the greatest sell on a small market team is that you truly have diehard fans that love the team better than it. I lived in LA for 15 years. Do you think they care about the Lakers if they're losing? Do you think they care about the Clippers if they're, I mean, they'll care if they're well, winning. They don't care about the Clippers in yeah, general. <laughs> that is true. They really don't. They really don't. You're, you hit it dead on the door now. But, you know, when you're in those big market towns, they only care if the franchise is winning. And I have to say that about SAC. Even a small, uh, a small market team where a team has missed the playoffs for 15 straight seasons, you still have a diehard fan base. And I think that's one of the best sells that you can give to any player out there is the fact that you're not going to get this love and admiration in a big city where there's so many other things that contribute for that. So if there's a silver lining on trying to acquire a big name in Sacramento, maybe that's it. The buck showed us it's possible. And honestly, I think that it can, um, it can happen, but it, it's, it may not be tomorrow or the day after. And we can easily see that Doko, Matt, looking exactly like the Deer District if that day ever comes. And in fact, yes, people see that yes. as the finals. But I'm telling you, that could look like that for the for the damn playing tournament. I mean, that's just <laughs> let's just be real. <laughs> if the Kings were the eighth seed in a, in a legit playoff series and they had lost games one and two to whoever the number one seed is by 40 points each, game three is still going to be off the hook a party like we've never seen. And, and like, I mean, you talk about, I mean, Phoenix showed up as well. You talked about Wisconsin even a couple seasons ago when the Toronto Raptors won the NBA finals, how that city uh, embraced uh, that championship as well as huge. And, and look, I had Dante Green, former Sacramento King on the Locked on Kings podcast today. And the, when I asked him, what do you remember the most? about Sacramento the first thing that he talks about uh, is the fans and we know Chris Webber fell in love with the fan base here uh, we know so many players to decided to return and live here uh, and be a part of this community because of how they embraced them so it's that not so hidden secret that still somehow is a secret to players around the league that uh, I, I hope we get the opportunity to share that from a playoff setting at some point in the near future because the Golden One Center is built uh, to be full and, and to host some playoff series. And heck, it's even built to host some, I mean, the California Classic coming up is awesome. Very much looking forward to that. And uh, we're going to have some uh, NCAA March Madness in there eventually as well, which I'm looking forward to. So DOCO and, and the Golden One Center, man, is built for events like that. And hopefully this will be the season uh, that the Kings finally get there. But if they're going to, they, they, they got some work to do starting tomorrow night kevin you didn't get your that, pick i, I got to know what your ninth pick would be for sacramento oh who my ninth pick would be uh honestly i would go with moses moody the uh the forward out of arkansas reason being i'll just be honest i've seen more tape on him than uh some of these other guys that we've talked about the kai joneses of the world um so i, I and another thing is I really, really, really love Arkansas's head coach, whose name is slipping Eric Musselman, me. former Kings right. head coach. Eric Musselman, thank you. Musselman, really a big fan of him. I've actually followed him for uh, uh, quite some time, but just the, uh, the system, you know, he has that really, he kind of reminds me of like that old school kind of um, Bobby Hurley-ish, uh, just, just, just ground and pound, you know. If you look at how well Moody runs, I get it, he's a wing, but just – if you look at a lot of the uh, intangibles that this guy has and you look at Musselman and the way he incorporates that philosophy, he's, he, he comes from, um, what was it? Um, 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 Bill Musselman, his slip, father. Slip in my head. Not, well, no, not his father, uh, the other school he was at. Um, but oh, anyway. Nevada, uh, when he was at he, Reno. He, 
he comes, you know, he brings that pedigree with him. And I've always been a, a fan of his. So I would personally go with Moses Moody, but I'll say this guys, I'll be honest. I don't love him. I, I, I think he's a great player. I think the tape that I've watched on him, I think he's an incredible asset. I think he can stretch the floor. I think he brings a, uh, and he's a good defender. Um, I, I think he brings a lot of those things and talents to the uh, Kings, but it's not somebody I look at like, oh man, you know, you get this guy and, he, you know, your franchise is, is, is going to go, you know, like a generational talent, shall I say. Yeah. Um, so I will go ahead. Say, Kevin, if Wagner is 1A for me, Moses is, uh, Moody is a very close 1B. Uh, just because of, uh, I mean, the biggest knock on his game is he lacks athleticism for his size, uh, but he does have a, I think, seven foot two or seven foot three measured wingspan. wingspan. And then, he has a more uh, defined uh, three point game than Wagner has, which would help for floor spacing, which the Sacramento Kings so desperately want and need on their offensive end. Uh, so I love, I would be thrilled with the, a, a Moses Moody pick on draft. Now I'd say I would maybe not thrilled. I would thrilled. be happy with <laughs> Wagner. I would be thrilled with the right trade. Exactly. And, and that's what I would go. Like I said, I'm not in love with him, but I would, I would not be mad <laughs> if they, if they selected him. But I think the consensus between all three of us is that we're not in love with anybody particularly in that uh, specific spot, which is why we would go with a trade um, for that. So, uh, so that's what, that, that's what I would go with. That's what I'm sticking with. Uh, final words, guys, uh, we'll go around final words on this before we wrap it check up it, here. Check out the NBA draft. ABC 10 tips off Thursday at five, right on ABC 10. That's the first time the NBA draft has been on our station. It's going to be fun. Join Sean Cunningham as he wills Scotty Barnes to fall to nine. And I'm fully on board. Whatever we got to do, let's make it happen. He is Draymond, I, Draymond Green. I don't, even call him, I don't even call him poor man's Draymond Green. He's Draymond Green without being a dick. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what he is. And I, you know, maybe not, as, uh, maybe not the bad guy that Draymond has, has become that we all know and love, but I think he'd be a, he's not the abrasive Draymond that, that just grinds on his teammates. So I think he's exactly what the Kings need. After, need Hallibur that grit. after Halliburton falls to 12, if Scotty Barnes somehow falls to nine, do we start looking at Monty McNair conspiracy theories of having like pictures or something <laughs> of, of how he's able to pull that off twice in a row? I'd be thrilled, but it's not going to happen. But if it does, no. man, I'm, I'm here for it. No, it won't happen. Unfortunately. Well, Scotty Barnes, if, if you're listening, that is Sean Cunningham's pitch, open pitch to you <laughs> to get your butt over here to the he capital has, city. He has no fall. control. He has no control. Yeah. There's going to be four, there's four teams lining up in front of the Kings that are ready to grab him. We'll see. We'll see what will happen. Well, while we don't know what will happen tomorrow, what we do know is, like Sean said, you can catch the draft on ABC 10. Coverage starts at 5 o'clock. And, of course, we will have a, uh, a little pre-show and a post-game show uh, following the NBA draft. We look forward to what happens there. The great Matt George, we thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, we look forward to having you on here the next time as well. So thank you so much for your insight, your charisma your hilarious jokes. And we look forward to having you in the newsroom to get us tea, coffee, and whatever else Sean Cunningham puts you to, to use with. So See, now, I know, now I know Kevin's lying. Cause he said my jokes were hilarious, but well, uh, he also called you great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take what I can get. I'm looking forward to working with you more gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And of course uh, that's Sean Cunningham, Matt George. I am Kevin John with ABC 10. We look forward to seeing you guys next week, same time, same place and tomorrow on ABC 10 for the draft. All right, peace out.